from the Gospel of Luke. Now as they went on their way, he, Jesus, entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, and so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. Before I start this message today, uh, I just wanna lift up a prayer, I ask you to join me in this prayer as we think about Mother's Day. Let's pray. Faithful God, uh, we lift our praise to you. Along with the broader community, we recognize the special day known as Mother's Day. We're so grateful for the women in our lives who nurture us, who now or in the past have mothered us in many and varied ways. Thank you. But Lord, we also acknowledge that this day can bring grief to the hearts of those for whom memories or loss or unfulfilled longings rise to the surface. And so, Holy Spirit, we call upon you to be in all of this where there is gratitude and where there is struggle. Renew our appreciation for each of the amazing women who have touched our lives, and surely there are many. And may it be so, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let's talk about Mary and Martha, Martha and Mary. How many times have you heard or read or studied this story? Across the years, how many sermons have been preached about this scene? Across my 22 years, how many sermons have I preached about this passage? To say that these verses from the Gospel of Luke are well-worn is to understate. But before you determine that you've heard it all before, I'm going to ask you to just stay with me, please. And so I want to pray again. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for your word, for the stories, the lessons, the teachings from scripture. As we delve into this age old story, open our minds and open our hearts as to how it is that you want to reveal Jesus to us through these words today. As we revisit this scene, stir our curiosity and pique our interest to consider it anew. Teach us, Lord. In his name, amen, amen. So we find ourselves in this sermon series called The Table, Jesus' Recipes. So far we've considered Jesus' recipes for hospitality, for spiritual growth, and for mission. And today it is my blessing to delve into Jesus' recipe for grace. And let me just say, these topics aren't just random topics. These focuses are, in fact, Hopewell's core values. And these core values weren't just randomly chosen. These are things that were, that are important to Jesus. And here's what we know. If it's important to Jesus, it should very well be important to us. Wouldn't you say? So friends, today I welcome you to the table where Jesus is serving up a lesson, a recipe, a recipe for grace. Come, sit down, and let's consider what that might mean to us, his followers. Now, you know, I don't know what comes to your mind when you hear the word grace. Maybe you immediately think of a prayer said before a meal. One of Webster's definitions is elegant of beauty and form. I love that. But the grace of which we'll speak today is that component that is central to our faith. Faith in the God of us all and the belief in his son, Jesus the Christ, who came to this world teaching, loving, living, dying, 
rising all as the ultimate display of God's amazing grace for us, his creation. And there are layers to God's grace that are rich and meaning filled. And I want to give you uh, at least a, a thumbnail sketch of that recipe for grace. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, wrote and preached about the role of God's grace in our lives, the way it prepares us, the way it redeems us, and so importantly, continually shapes us into the people God created us to be. There are three parts, three ingredients, so to speak, to that recipe. First, prevenient grace. The word prevenient comes from the Latin root word that means to precede. So this preceding grace, it, it just simply exists. It's this gift from God available to everyone, not just a few. We can't earn it, nor do we deserve it. It's not something we can do on our own power. It's what God does. It's who God is. It's what we get, period. God's grace precedes everything. It's ours for the receiving. And then there's justifying grace. Wesley wrote, justification is another word for pardon. Again, this is what God does and who God is. What we must do is to open ourselves, open our hearts to receiving everything from God by faith. Receive God's forgiveness. Receive God's pardon. Justifying grace makes us right with God. Our sins are forgiven, and God can then begin the process of lining our lives up to God's original design for us. And then there's the third ingredient, sanctifying grace. The word sanctify means to make holy, but not in a holier than thou sort of way. Through sanctifying grace, God continually shapes us, molds us more and more into the likeness of Christ throughout our lives. Sanctifying grace reminds us that we haven't arrived, but we are encouraged in this process of becoming, becoming more like Jesus. Wesley used a, a metaphor that's helpful in describing, describing grace relative to our spiritual journeys. And the metaphor is that of a house. So listen to this. Prevenient grace is like the porch of the house. Prevenient grace prepares our hearts and our, our minds to hear and receive the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And then there's the door of the house. When we open the door of justification, of pardon, here's where we acknowledge our sin and our need for salvation, for God's grace and mercy. And then, then we're invited to step over the threshold, into the house, into the life that God has in store for us. We're entering into God's sanctifying grace. Thank you for that metaphor, John Wesley. And then retired United Methodist Bishop and well-known author Will Willimon says this. He writes, grace is the power of God working in you to give you a transformed life a transformed life, this power of God working in you. But now back to the story, Mary and Martha. So I wanna stretch that house metaphor because here we have Jesus, this absolute personification of grace. There was Jesus, God's ultimate expression of grace on the porch of Martha's house and already these women and the others in the household knew Jesus and they were ready. They were eager. And then Jesus is at the door on the threshold. I, I just imagine these sisters knowing full well that surely they were in need of God's grace and they were hungry for it. And then Jesus steps across the threshold into the house. 
And here's where things get really interesting for sure, because Mary and Martha have two very different responses to the fact that Jesus is in the house. In his book, uh, The Only Necessary Thing, theologian Henry Nowlin writes this, Regrettably, this story has often suffered from dubious interpretations, with Martha being the poster child for all that is wrong with the life and the attitude of serving. And we see in the story that Martha takes very seriously the responsibility of hospitality, a, a core value then and surely one that we value here and now. And then there's Mary. Mary, in the presence of Jesus, is the one who daringly steps out of the mores of the culture to slip into the role of disciple, of student, a role that was reserved for men. Two people, two very different approaches. Now, I just have to wonder if when you hear this story, you find yourself aligning with Martha, the serving sister, or Mary, the student sister. I have to confess that so often across the years, I've tended to sympathize with Martha. I mean, here's my deal. If there's work to be done, then let's get it done. And then if there's time, we can sit. And some of you might not be surprised to learn that I lean in that direction. While others of you might say, for crying out loud, if Jesus were in the house, I'd drop everything and I'd give him every ounce of my attention. Two people encountering Jesus, yet very differently. And then as the story plays out in my mind, I, I picture the men gathered around Jesus as he speaks. And I wonder what Mary did. Did she timidly hunker down in the back of the group or in her eagerness, did she make her way forward trying to get close to Jesus? And again, clearly and according to the culture, she should not have been there. She did not, they said, deserve to be there. But listen, here's what happens, friends. Jesus sees her. He sees Mary's hunger and her longing. He gives her his grace, his favor, and he welcomes her. Jesus meets her where she is. He accepts Mary and encourages her, encourages her to grow. But also in this scene, Jesus sees Martha. He sees the burden she feels. He sees that she is distracted by all of the things for which she feels responsible. And Jesus does not minimize her efforts, not at all. And again, as I step back into that scene and try to imagine, I see Jesus pausing and I picture that maybe he would reach out to take Martha's hand in his and say in a voice full of love and compassion, those words we've come to know so well. He said, Martha, Martha, you're worried and distracted by many things, but right now, few things are needed. Jesus' words to Martha are not a rebuke. Jesus offers these words as an invitation to her to be with him. And I also love to imagine that Jesus might have then said to Martha, thank you for all your hard work, but now just come and sit with us. It's all you need for now. And Henry now and then goes on to write, this story is not one of a hero and a villain. We see that the sisters embody the truth that there are surely different ways of coming before our God, of loving and serving our God. But most importantly, what this story reminds us is that Jesus meets them where they are. Jesus sees them both and encourages them to move toward becoming who God has called them to be. This, this is the sanctifying grace of Jesus Christ. This call to be holy, born out of humility. You know, in these five brief verses, Jesus' intuition, his compassion, his grasp of the curious natures of these two sisters results in this beautiful grace for the moment. 
sanctifying grace, neither condemning or shaming either one, but offering a blessing. This, my friends, is what Jesus does. He sees us. Jesus does not shame. Jesus does not condemn. Jesus sees us. And in his abundant grace, Jesus is always offering us opportunities to draw closer to him and to grow in that grace. And you know where all of this leads. It leads us. It calls us to do the same for one another. Jesus calls us to see each other, to be curious about where others are coming from or what has motivated them to better understand before we judge. And then to offer grace in our encounters, our relationships, so that each one may move and grow toward Christ. You know, I really believe that we can learn from both Mary and Martha. It's a great story, isn't it? But the real lesson comes from Jesus. Actually, and you know this, in every story, the real lesson comes from Jesus because the main thing is always the main thing, and Jesus is the main thing. Grace. How do we capture the essence of grace? Grace begins with God. It precedes everything. Can't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's a gift from God because of God's amazing love for us. We have God's favor. And then there is the awareness that we need God's grace because we do sin and fall short. But God forgives and we are justified. God's greatest act of grace came to us in the form of his one and only son, for God so loved the world. And then there is this sanctifying grace. Knowing these things, accepting all of this, we then get a glimpse of God's heart. And then, then we look to Jesus. We follow Jesus. And all the while, the Holy Spirit is moving and working in our lives, across all of our lives, steering us toward holiness of heart and actions. Remind us again of Will Williman's words. Grace is the power of God working in you, in me, and giving us a transformed life. And then, just as Jesus did, we love God. And we love people in ways that can and will transform the world around us. Each and every one of us invited to the table of grace. Please come, come to the table. And this is what Jesus then does. He transforms the table into an altar. And then he shares bread and grace saying again and again, do this in remembrance of me. May it be so. Amen.